Welcome. My name is Michelle Amazine. I'm the director of the Communications Research Center. On behalf of the CRC's research fellows, welcome to the Spring 2022 Dr. Melvin Ellsworth Distinguished Lecture Series. This is an event that we host once a semester to highlight distinguished scholars from outside Boston University to share their outstanding scholarship, expertise, and experience with the BU community. Today we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Meredith B. Clark, who I will introduce in just a minute. A few housekeeping notes first. Uh, please silence your phones, laptops, devices, etc. And as part of BU's policies in the classroom here, we do need to be wearing masks. So please do have your mask on. Um, Dr. Clark's talk will last approximately 45 minutes, which will be followed by 15 minutes of question and answer. And I know some of you have been thinking up some really tough questions for her, so keep those, keep those coming. We'll have time for that. And then after the talk, you are all invited to come upstairs in Com 209, where we will have a reception in Dr. Clark's honor, and you can continue the conversation with her. There will be free food and beverages, so please join us. Our guest of honor today is Dr. Meredith D. Clark, who is an associate professor in the School of Journalism and the Department of Communication Studies at Northeastern University. She's also the founding director of Northeastern's new Center for Communication, Media Innovation, and Social Change. The center will be a hub for the advanced study of race, ethnicity, and activism, with an emphasis on media impact and the empowerment of marginalized communities. Dr. Clark has a BA in political science from Florida A&M University, and a Master of Science in newspaper journalism from, from there as well. She earned her PhD in mass communication from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on the intersections of race, media, and power, covering everything from media processes like newsroom hiring and reporting practices to the di digital narratives constructed by social media communities. She's been studying Black Twitter since 2010 and is finishing a book about it. Is that from uh, Oxford University? In 2015, theroot.com named her number 66 on their list of the 100 most influential Black Americans. Please join me in welcoming Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So first, I've got to shout out the first person um, who gave a little applause when I was first introduced. I don't know who you are, but I love you, and I thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to try this again. So I always start my talks with a little story about who I am. Um, Audrey Lord is one of my feminist heroes, and uh, she wrote, I suppose, and she always started her talks by introducing herself as a black, lesbian, feminist scholar and teacher. So I'm a black woman, um, a black feminist scholar. I am from the South. I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky. I just recently relocated to Boston uh, in July, August, and have just experienced my first Boston winter. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to try and stick this out. I heard this one was pretty mild. But I, I tell you that to get into the talk and to give you some orientation of where I am and sort of where I'm going. So this is breaking all the rules, the racial grammar of cancel culture in American news media. And to understand exactly why I'm talking about cancel culture and what it has to do with news media, especially for an audience of folks that I assume are interested in being in journalism and news, I gotta take you back to a little bit of my background. So prior to becoming an academic, I was a journalist. I worked in newsrooms throughout the Southeast and in Texas, which is its own country, by the way. Um, and there I came across something that stood out to me because of my background and my training. I was a copy editor. 
And I, I bring this stuff together to get to the first point. So this is the DeFleur lecture. And DeFleur actually co-authored one of the textbooks that I used and learned from uh, when I was pursuing both my master's and my PhD. And so I thought it just appropriate to start with a little bit of theory. Anybody recognize this one? A couple of hands. Oh, the last thing I meant to say about my background, I'm also a preacher's kid. Uh, and so I'm used to a little bit of call and respond, a little bit of interaction. I'm a product of the black church. Normally, I would have folks, I see you in the background, they're my people. Um, I would have folks come forward, you know, when we are gathered in the assembly and people are way back in the back, they want you to come forward, but it's a little bit difficult here. But I say that I'm a preacher's daughter and give you that background so that you understand that there's a relationship that I'm looking for with the audiences that I'm speaking to. So I'm going to be up here speaking for about 45 minutes, but I like a little bit of feedback. And so if you've got snaps, if you've got claps, if you've got comments, oohs, ahs, whatever they are, bring them on. I welcome them. But I position myself within the hierarchy of influences model right there in the center. So if you're familiar with this, you'll know that this model is the way that news is produced, and specifically, what sort of forces impact the facts and the reporting of facts that we ultimately call news. So that external layer there is ideological and sociocultural forces. We think about the culture that we have in the United States, in Canada, in China, in the different countries that we're from in this room. We think about extra media forces, everything from advertisements to the number of people who are actually clicking on our stories, all of those external things that get us to write headlines in a particular way or frame a story for a certain audience. We have the organizational level, and if you're working inside a newsroom or inside any business, bless you, you know that every single organization has a culture. I'm here from Northeastern. Northeastern has a very specific culture. I imagine BU has a very specific culture. And if you've done an internship or you've worked in a news organization, you know that there's a culture there too. Next, we have the level of media routines. Those things that we are used to doing as journalists because we have been trained how to do them. Things like making sure that if you go out to cover a story, and the story is about a dog getting hit by a car, you get the name of the dog. Those media routines also weigh in on the way that we report news and information. But to get down to the center, to the reason that I tell you that I'm a black feminist scholar, that I had a journalism background, that I'm the child of a minister, uh, rest in peace, may my father rest, and that I am a journalist, is so that you understand where I am coming from when I talk about the issues that we are going to walk through today. You see, journalists are at the center of what we know of as news. We are the individuals who ultimately have the say about the realization that people get presented as news. So those facts, the stories, the anecdotes, the quotes, those decisions rest with us, how they are put together and how they are presented to an audience. And that is why in August of 2010, when I was wrapping up one of my last newspaper jobs and I was searching on my computer just for something to read in between days, I don't know if any of you have finished a job, but you know, the last couple of days, a little free, you get to do what you want and kind of waste time. <laughs> That's what I was doing that morning, clicking around, and I clicked on this story. It was actually August 11th when I read the story. This was published in August of 2010. And my first job in journalism was as a copy editor, which is why this story stood out to me. And you can see the headline here, and here's where we're going to do a little call and response. What does the headline say? How black people use Twitter. How black people use Twitter. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> the problem that I had with this story, and with this headline in particular, is that it wasn't very discriminating. It painted a picture of how black people on this social networking platform were using it. And ultimately, as you dug into the story, you find out 
that the people who are represented as experts are media elites. One of them was Baratunde Thurston, who used to write for The Onion and has written a book about black culture. Another was, was Elon James White, who is his own uh, media producer in his own right. He had a whole podcast network. And then the third person, a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, who came up with this idea of black tech. And so as a copy editor, as a journalist, as someone who understands that when you write headlines, you write them so that people who are never going to read the story at least know what it's about, I was disturbed with this headline. Because if you don't dig into the story, and further, if you don't get into what it means to be black and to use Twitter in a specific way, you come away from this story with an idea that this is how all black people are using Twitter. That they're all tweeting with hashtags like words that lead to trouble. Or one of the more provocative ones mentioned in this story, you ain't hitting it right. If you walk away from this story understanding that this is the way that black people use Twitter, what happens is that you are replicating an idea of deviance that has characterized black communities within the United States and throughout the world for years. And so I took this story and I literally printed a copy of it and I carried it with me to UNC Chapel Hill. And ultimately it became the basis for what would be my dissertation and now some 12 years later, my book. In 2020, another 10 years later, I had the opportunity to reflect on what I had learned over 10 years of study of Black Twitter. Now, if you'll think back with me in July of 2020, what, what was going on across the country in July of 2020? George Floyd protesting. Right, protest related to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey. Anything else happening in July 2020? COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic, we were all stuck in the house, bored in the house, and we were in the house bored. <laughs> Anything else? I think another big one is the fact, and it happened a year later, was you know, Biden won election with the recession agenda. We are just a few months away from the 2020 presidential election. So when this story popped up in one of my news feeds on Jan uh, July 7th, 2020, and I went to read it, I was instantly incensed because what it is, is the collection of thoughts from a group of a little more than 100 creative class folks. These are writers, intellectuals, professors, entertainers who had all signed on to this letter about justice and open debate. What they did not mention explicitly in this letter was that they are talking about cancel culture. They argue that we have come to a point in time in our nation's history where people are demanding swift retribution for comments that are made off the cuff that might be offensive or for actions that are not taken quickly enough to protect vulnerable people and vulnerable groups. What they were saying in the context of this letter, echoes of which we have seen in recent editorials by the New York Times, is that cancel culture is a threat to American democracy because it is a threat to conversation and to deliberation. The problem with this is, is that it is hinting at something that we call racial grammar. Racial grammar is a term coined by Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who is a sociologist who came up with the idea of colorblind racism. That is, that we ignore race and differences, then perhaps we can get to a better society. Racial grammar, Eduardo Bonilla Siva says, provides the deep structure, the logic, and the rules of proper composition of racial statements, and more importantly, what can be seen, understood, and even felt about racial matters. Now to put this to the test, again, a little more call and response. You've heard of racial grammar. You've seen it expressed. But I want to make sure that it's salient for all of us before we continue. So I'm going to throw out a term for you. 
When we talk about at-risk kids in our nation's school systems, which kids are we talking about? We are talking about minority students. We're often talking about black and brown students, particularly poor students. Let me give you another one. Now, this one's a little bit dated. I'm, I'm trying to find a more up-to-date uh, approach to this. But I'm in my 40s, and I grew up listening to radio before we had our streaming services and all that good stuff. If anybody still listens to the radio, then maybe this will track with you. If not, follow along with me. When I say I'm talking about urban contemporary radio, what kind of radio am I talking about? Hip-hop and R&B. Hip-hop and R&B. Who makes hip-hop and R&B? The Weeknd. <laughs> Fair. Fair. <laughs> what kind of people make hip-hop and R&B? Black and brown. Black and brown people. So these are examples of racial grammar, right? We, we don't want to say that this is black and brown radio because that's exclusive. We don't want to say that these are black and brown kids because we don't want to pick out a certain group of people in order to talk about how they may or may not be achieving. So racial grammar allows us to use euphemisms to communicate a point about race without actually having to talk about it. That's what I saw in that post about the Harper's letter on justice and open debate. So as I mentioned, from 2010 to 2020, and even until today, I've been studying something called Black Twitter. And that is the way that Black people use Twitter. The way they self-identify as Black people, choose to perform that identity online, the way that they communicate with one another and affirm each other's presence on the platform, the way that our conversations are reaffirmed in the physical world, in the media-built environment, as one of my colleagues says, with things like signs, and the way, ultimately, that Black Twitter seeks vindication. So in the summer of 2013, I noticed that there was an interesting pattern in June, July, and August. And that was that black people were using Twitter to demand accountability from high-ranking public figures, some of them vortex public figures, for things that they had done that perhaps slighted the black community. The three examples that I gave <coughs> From the top, in June of 2020, or excuse me, of 2013, Paula's Best Dishes. This hashtag is, is in response to Paula Dean being brought up on charges of workplace bigotry and workplace <coughs> discrimination. Black Twitter took the names of Southern Dishes and references to racism and how racism is performed against black people and mashed them up to come up with different dishes that they use to mock Paula Dean. So I don't know if you can see this. The graphic's a little bit old. This is drawn from Twitter back in 2013. It looks the same. Looks the same? Yeah. Good the one in the middle by Sarone Russell, Coon on the top, Coon being a racial epithet to describe black people. Uh, another one, Loving versus Virginia Ham. I don't know if there are any other Southerners in the crowd, but Virginia Ham is very salty, very tasty kind of ham, but it also references Loving versus Virginia, the case that ultimately decided that interracial marriage could be legal in the United States. In creating these hashtags, individuals drew so much attention to Paula Dean that she apologized not once, not twice, but three separate times. So there was something about this online conversation that could draw attention outside of black Twitter as a racial group, as a group of a certain kind of user, and get mass media's attention. That attention from news media was so caustic for Paula Dean that she decided to apologize several times. 
Ultimately, she lost a number of endorsement deals and temporarily faded from public consciousness. Temporarily. The second instance that I noticed where black Twitter was using this process that I call black digital resistance was in July of 2013. This was the month that George Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin. The day after the verdict was announced, Anderson Cooper had an interview with one of the jurors from this case. And she mentioned, just as an offhand remark, that she had a book deal based on her experience. Black Twitter users reacted to this en masse. And one person, Jeannie Lauren, who was over there at Cocky McSwagalot, <laughs> decided to create a petition to get that publisher to drop Juror B37's book deal. What people said as they signed that petition, as they retweeted it, as they drew attention to it, is do you remember what happened with Paula Dean? We can mobilize, we can use this platform to speak out. We can use it to affect change in the offline realm. And they did. Within two days of the petition being created, Juror B37's book deal was dropped. The third and final case that I take from 2013 to structure this conversation is in reaction to a confession that a professor had on Twitter. This professor, a white man who professed himself to be a feminist, admitted to harassing black feminists and to taking up space in ways that were damaging to feminist communities. When black feminists spoke about his reaction online, they found that they did not hear from their sisters in feminist struggle across racial lines. And so one of them, Nikki Kendall, created the hashtag Solidarity is for white women which ultimately trended around the globe as women all across the world talked about what it felt like to be marginalized within feminist communities along the basis of race. This started a series of conversations about how feminists could bridge racial gaps in order to work together. Each of these instances is something that we might today refer to as cancel culture. The last one that I'll mention actually comes from December 2014, where a number of black women, women of color, and women from structurally marginalized groups decided that if their speech was going to be co-opted and taken off the platform in ways that did not make sense to them, in ways that were not true to their purpose, they were going to step away from the platform. They called this protest, this tweet called my back a plan to snatch back their influence on the platform. And as I studied this, I found that what people who were structurally marginalized were doing was using this platform in order to demand accountability where otherwise there might not be any. This idea became salient to me in 2014 when Russell Simmons, the founder of Def Jam, which is a major hip hop label, tweeted this, it is a parody, a skit, with Harriet Tubman seducing her master in order to blackmail him with a sex tape. <laughs> you can imagine that this did not go over very well. What Black Twitter did, based on its summer of accountability, was to call folks out. And calling folks out, like Russell Simmons, was one of the first ways that Black Twitter engaged in large-scale accountability practice. It was breaking from Black traditions about family business and talking about things only inside the Black community. It allowed people with little individual recourse to use their accounts and their followings to demand symbolic vindication through acknowledgement, absolution, and apology. So when Russell tweeted this video and said it was the funniest thing he had ever seen, he pulled this within a day because of the backlash. And when he pulled it, he went on an apology tour, posting his apology on multiple accounts and releasing statements to the media. In a statement posted to his Global Grind website, Simmons said this, and I quote, 
In the whole history of Deaf Comedy Jam, I've never taken down a controversial comedian. When my buddies from the NAACP called and asked me to take down the Harriet Tubman video from the All Deaf Digital YouTube channel and apologize, I agreed. I'm a very liberal person with thick skin. My first impression of the Harriet Tubman piece was that it was about what one of the actors said in the video, that 162 years later, there's still tremendous injustice. And with Harriet Tubman outwitting the slave master, I thought it was politically correct. Silly me. I can now understand why so many people are upset. I have taken down the video. Lastly, I would never condone violence against women in any form. And for all those offended, I am sincerely sorry." End quote. People might refer to what happened to Russell Simmons in this particular case as cancel culture. Simmons was called out online. He was called to, do, to make some sort of apology, to take a particular action for repair. But what we call the phenomenon that was met, that Paula D. met, that Russell Simmons met, that Juror B-37 met, what we call it matters, particularly when we think about it as a matter of culture or cultural production. Now, if journalists had called it anything else, perhaps something without alliteration, I could have perhaps ignored it. But cancel culture, that name stuck. And therein lies the problem. In my lifetime, and certainly before, culture has become a salient means of naming the other. James Davison Hunter, an author, let's get through really quickly here, an author had this to say about something he termed the culture wars. In the early 1990s, as the religious right was seeking to influence American politics, and to do so through media, Hunter took this assessment of the media landscape and wrote up in his book, Culture Wars, The Struggle to Define America, who got to set public discourse. He said this, quote, public discourse is a discourse of elites. From my vantage point, the power of culture is in the power to define reality, the power to frame the debate and the power that resides among the elites. Culture wars was an abstract way to talk about dominance and subjugation in the United States. It is the kind of abstraction that Lee Atwater, a political strategist, spoke about in 1981 in an unnamed interview with a political scientist. He said this, you start out in 1954 by saying N word, N word, N word. But by 1968, you can't say N word anymore. That hurts. That backfires. So you say stuff like horse busing, states' rights, and that stuff. And you're getting so abstract. Now you're cutting about, talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things that you're talking about are totally economic things. And a byproduct of them is that blacks get hurt worse than whites. We want to cut this is much more abstract than even the busing thing, and a hell of a lot more abstract than inward, inward. The abstraction is the point. When we assign culture to cancellation and erase the history of black vernacular practice that comes along with someone being quote unquote canceled, we're participating in a form of this abstraction that Atwater talked about using as a strategy way back in the 80s. To bring this up to date, we have seen this abstraction effectively employed by news media in a number of ways. Atwater mentioned force busing. We see these images taken from right here in the city of Boston where people reacted to the discussion around forced busing. We've heard about the culture of po poverty, a way to talk about being poor as a moral failing, something that is specifically assigned to black and brown communities. We talk about welfare queens, 
women who are said to be exploiting the system of government assistance, often assumed to be black women who are having children and collecting government checks in order to exploit tax-paying citizens, who are somehow never pictured as other black women, but always pictured and thought about along racial lines. Crack babies, or cocaine kids, as Tom Brokaw reported on back in the 80s. Bringing it more up to date from the 1990s, those crack babies were thought to grow up to become super predators. And recently, with one of the cases that I mentioned earlier, in 2013, assigning the term thugs to think about black youth and the way that they present themselves. This, again, is racial grammar. It is the deep structure, the logic, and the rules of proper composition of racial statements, and more, that can be seen, understood, and felt about racial matters. Today, we've moved on just a little bit from cancel culture, but I leave this last example about being woke. On the left, you have a group of 100 woke women who were sort of canonized by Essence Magazine for their work in order to promote social justice. Thinking about wokeness with a connotation that is rooted in black vernacular practice that means to be aware of structural inequalities and to take action based on that awareness. Wokeness is now being recodified to think about an intolerant group of people, most commonly thought of as the intolerant left, who demand that we make concessions for identity, for position in, in society, and for other concessions that powerful people are not willing to make. This, too, is part of the culture war, the moving back and forth between the right and the left. But both of these things use race, and race is a crude heuristic for power, but an effective one. Race helps us to collapse other categories, socioeconomic status, gender, class, sexuality, and religion. And culture does much of the same work. As a label, I argue that culture is even more damaging because it obscures how power works. In 2014, culture was Merriam-Webster's word of the year. It was the word that more people looked up than any other word online at that time. Merriam-Webster defined culture as this a term that conveys a kind of academic attention to systematic behavior and allows us to identify and isolate an idea, an issue, or a group. We speak of a culture of transparency or consumer culture. Culture can either be very broad, as in celebrity culture or winning culture, or I, I might add a culture of poverty, or very specific, as in test prep culture marching band culture, or, as I will add today, cancel culture. As with Manju's observation about how black people use Twitter, the broadcast nature of the social networking platform, like Twitter, has created crossover, where black vernacular traditions are observed, critiqued, and too often decontextualized as they are presented to the masses. In studying black Twitter for over a decade, I've seen how the phenomenon that we now refer to as cancel culture has evolved and ultimately been excised from its roots in black vernacular tradition. Now to explain some of the analog antecedents to canceling folks, I draw upon Audre Lorde and her ideas about useful anger. Audre Lorde says that everything can be used, that nothing is wasteful. And you'll have to remember this when you are cause, or excuse me, when you are accused of being destructive. That anger manifests itself in a number of different ways. Before there was canceling, in black communities, we read people. We dragged people. Reading is naming aloud those shameful parts of a person that one would otherwise like to keep secret. 
It is calling out, cussing out, and describing to a T those things that you would rather other people not know about you. Dragging is similar, but it's dependent on having an audience that often participates. These things are a matter of digital intersectionality practice, which my colleagues, uh, Brandisha Times, Josh Shushke, and Sophia Noble describe as a practice of countering dominant discourses on social media as conversation. One that it, it is intersectional, multidimensional, and less restricted. It enables users in order to talk back and mobilize around topics outside of the view of the mainstream until they go viral, at which point they gain the desired attention of the mainstream news media. I think of it as digital accountability practice, calling someone out, having these debates, asking them to account for the things that they have said or done in a very public way. But when these practices were observed within Black Twitter and then brought to mainstream news media without the proper context, they became collapsed into an idea of a certain kind of deviant culture. Loretta Ross, who is a black feminist, said that this particular culture is toxic. She advocated for calling people in instead of calling them out. The problem with this is that in order to call someone in, you must have a relationship of mutual respect. Now the tweets that I list here are from Alyssa Milano, who was part of the racial justice protest in 2014, 2016, 2018, 2019. And in 2019, as she's reflecting on some racial justice protests, she says, I can't believe that this is my country. And then later in the day, she responds and posts these DMs. She was contacted by a member of the activist class who said, yes, this is your country and it always has been but she was called in rather than called out. Because she had a previous relationship with this individual, Brittany Pratt, Patnett, excuse me, she was able to be corrected, to recognize how she did not understand the dynamics at play, and then to shift her position. Calling in is something that is productive. But canceling is something that is sexy and more attractive to talk about. So for reading, dragging, and calling folks out, I, I have this video, and I'm afraid that technology may not work for me because technology has failed me twice today. But if you have time in your evening, you might be able to play this clip from True Blood. You can see what it's labeled up at the top, AIDS Burger. This is an example of reading someone or even of dragging someone as it occurs in a public place. But these things were originally a practice of how we interacted with one another. But because we were on Twitter, where other people could see what black people were doing in black enclaves, where the conversation was public, where that conversation was quickly adopted, and those practices... He said the burger... Y'all remember me saying that technology has failed me today? That wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, where others could see what this practice is like and quickly adopted it, it was co-opted, stripped of its original meaning, and ultimately converted into cancel culture. Before I move on, y'all want to see this video? Okay. Um, trigger warning, content warning, there is some um, incendiary language in We're this. adults. We can handle it. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that feedback. Listen, don't, don't come for me tomorrow and uh, talk about this video. All right, here we go. No problem with my burger. Just a couple of drunk rednecks, that's all. Well, what's their problem? Oh, come on now, it's not worth it. Can we turn it up? What did they say? He said... What did they say, Arlene? He said the burger might have AIDS. Lafayette. Oh, fudge. 
Excuse me. Who ordered the hamburger with age? I ordered the hamburger deluxe. In this restaurant, a hamburger deluxe come with french fries, lettuce, tomato, mayo, and eggs. Do anybody got a problem with that? Yeah. I'm an American, and I got to say it who makes my food. Well, baby, it's too late for that. Fag has been breeding your cows, raising your chickens, even brewing your beer long before I walk my sexy ass up in this motherfucker. Everything on your goddamn table got AIDS. You still ain't making me eat no AIDS burger. All you gotta do is say, hold the AIDS. Yeah. That was disturbing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I gave it a kind of warning. All right, where was I? Right here. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was a read. Babies and gentle dens, I should say. That was a read. But this sort of practice has been co-opted from online spaces. My friend Andre Block says that reading was originally a practice of black women signifying, that call outs have been occasionally mistaken for black Twitter's mob mentality, but these things are qualitatively different. They are a critique of systemic inequality rather than attack, an attack against specific individualistic transgressions. When Russell Simmons tweeted the Harriet Tubman sex tape, Critiques within Black Twitter focus less on the media maker himself and more on the issues of systemic subjugation of Black women, living and dead, whose choices are, excuse me, Simmons' choices tended to reduce Hub Tubman into a tired trope of sexual deviance. And that incited public shaming, but also a demand for a powerful Black figure to deal with images of Black women responsibly. These practices have application. They have use. And in my scholarly commitment to advancing black women's theorizing in the digital age, age, I promote a Lordian analysis of one of the uses of anger in advocating for black women's equity in civil society and discourse. Lord's theory of useful anger requires the emotional and physical reactions to racism and injustice be thought of as useful rather than wasteful, especially when channeled into action, specifically within the metaphysical work of dismantling the basic assumption that racism and the products of racism, sexism, and homophobia are immutable. Calling out, calling in, and canceling folks are all examples of the deployment of useful anger. They translate the energy of resisting oppression into demonstrable measures to call for accountability. Where accountability is impossible, these practices demand validation. That demand for validation is what we now see when people are being, quote unquote, canceled online. The problem with black Twitter's engagement in public shaming is that it is in its interpretation in the dominant culture's worldview. The problem is embedded in Black Twitter's refusal to abide by the dominating culture's rules. The outgroup categorization of Blackness is yet again reinforced across time, technologies, and ideologies. And in the digital spaces where Black feminists and more broadly Black people use creative rhetorics as a tool of self and community-based defense, we are situated as outsiders by those whose race gender, and class affords them a greater sense of privilege. In this sense, our rejection of conventional norms of debate and discussion is framed as yet another uncontrollable practice, a tendency to make us something to be feared rather than understood. And so when we talk about canceling people, and we refer to this as cancel culture, we are participating in restructuring these vernacular practices into something that is wholly different, that becomes understood as a moral panic, as a threat to anyone in a position of power. They called me out. 
they can come for you too. When canceling is co-opted in the same way that excerpts of black popular culture are taken from enclaves and presented for the masses, we run up against this problem that is mediated in mainstream news coverage. The criticism that this online behavior is not warranted, it's not activism, it is not valid. Or that it is the fault of big tech and algorithms that the fans are being flamed by news media and technology. Moreover, it presents a threat to us that, that presents our challenge here today. And so the question that I wrap up with today is how do we engage in productive dialogue? And I go back to my own lived experiences and think about something that a student at my former university, the University of Virginia, mentioned when we had a discussion about cancel culture and debate. He said to us that you all teach us how to be critical, but you do not teach us what to do. And so I offer you three things, three ways of approaching this context collapse around ideas like cancel culture that have been subjected to a recodification. First, is to be impeccable with your work. That is there. This is one of the four agreements. It is the very first one, but it is a charge that I find specific to journalists. We cannot allow folks, here we go, the right side, like former Governor Andrew Cuomo to deflect from allegations of sexual misconduct by saying that he is being canceled. We have words and terms that are specific for things like cyberbullying, sexual harassment, being publicly shamed, and being publicly shunned. We must use them. Second, we must confront actual threats to speech. One of the more dangerous arguments about the reclassification of so-called cancel culture and canceling people is this. The idea that somehow being called out, being called to task in a way that doesn't follow the polite rules of society is being censored. That somehow one of the five freedoms enumerated in the First Amendment is being threatened because people call you into accountability or they simply disagree with what you say. We must confront actual threats to speech, such as the executive order that banned the teaching of critical race theory in federal workshops, and the series of statutes, limitations, that are being introduced and passed across the country to ban, quote unquote, critical race theory as the teaching of part of American history. I found it very interesting that as I pulled this talk together, I remembered this slide. And I wanted to bring it up as an example of what happens when we succumb to racial grammar's influence. Racial grammar would tell us that to mention critical race theory is to say that people are racist or that they perpetuate racism. There are individuals who will use mainstream news media in order to recodify terms to get the public to think about this sort of dissension in a very particular way. One provocateur, Christopher Rufo, actually confessed to this last year. Just in case you can't see it, there are two tweets I'll read here. The first, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, babies and gentle thems, this is racial grammar in action. 
to recodify a legal framework that is used to interpret policy, history, and current events as something that is outlandish, as an idea that should be isolated, shunned, and even outlawed to the extent that we go so far as to violate the First Amendment by outlawing teaching of a particular idea. I leave you with this, the third part. The third remedy for dealing with racial grammar, specifically around cancel culture, but as you can see, the way it could be extended to other topics, is to demand and provide context for phenomena that are rooted in history and to acknowledge power dynamics. No matter the phrase, whether it is forced busing, at-risk kids, cancel culture, or critical race theory, we must, as journalists, remember this, that our words matter, and we have the power to create not only social reality, but also to succumb, to succumb to social fiction. The challenge is to us, and I issue it to you today. Thank you. You've already got a question, all right. I have a question for you. Um, why do you believe there's a lot of canceling in our day, Alan days? Is it like a big, can you hear me? A little, uh, once more, please. Um, Those of you in broadcast know we refer to this term as dead air. Thanks, Professor Kaka, for teaching that. Sorry about that. Um, why do you think there's a lot of cancellation in our world these days? Is it a problem we have too much cancellation? Should we do something about it? So, um, the thing, and this is why I like the Q&A portion better than I like giving talks. Um, the thing about cancel culture is that I would argue that cancel culture does not actually exist. So what should we do about it? So what we should do about it is refuse to use that specific label and to identify what is actually happening at the time. Are people protesting? Are they boycotting? Is it outrage, another blanket term that I, I use with caution and care? Are they being called into account for bad behavior? What is actually happening? Are people being cyber bullied? That's one of the criticisms that's often turned back to me. Well, if cancel culture isn't real, then what happened to my friend when her address was posted online? What is that? You should probably call the police if they find that, find that out. What, what is that term called? Doxing. It's doxing. There's a word for that, right? And we are journalists. We know this. It's lazy for us to use a term like cancel culture rather than to actually explain what is going on. We understand that people are busy, and just like with the headline example that I showed at the very beginning of this talk, folks may not take much from the stories that we write or the stories that we produce, but they will take the language that we use. We think of journalism as shorthand for constructing reality. We make very quick work of the reports, of the phenomena, of the conversations for people who otherwise don't have time to dig into those issues. If we abdicate our responsibility to whatever catchy term is a hit at the moment, we do a disservice to people. And so rather than using the term cancel culture, I challenge us to identify what is actually happening and to apply the correct label. Other questions? Dead air again. Regarding what you just said, um, so the onus, the responsibility, the onus and the responsibility are on journalists to use the right words in their headlines and in their writings. However, taking into account that outer sphere that you were talking about, um, as well as the external factors, such as the vast majority of our media system, of our media in the U.S. are advertising supported. Clicks matter, attention matters. If journalists who are under pressure know that if I use this 
cancel culture term or just, you know, quick witty, more people are going to click on this rather than if I take the time to explain things or use a different term. What, what, what is this? How do we, how do we work with this? It's a great question. Um, so what do we do about journalists who are pressed for time who also recognize the market forces of being able to create a buzzworthy headline that will get people to click on it, spend time with the story, share it, that sort of thing. If cancel culture does that, then why should we do something else? Um, there are a couple of things that we could do. We could think of other alliterations. Someone, when I was talking about cancel culture on a radio show, called in, and she said, it's not cancel culture, it's consequences culture. And all right, that might not fit as well in a short headline. You know, I was a copy editor. You may have to turn the hell out of it to get it into your headline. But we could call it consequences culture. We could refer to the problem that is at hand. When you go back to Andrew Cuomo talking about being canceled, there is a way to put that particular term into the story, but not necessarily lead with it as part of the headline. Governor is combative about sexual allegations or sexual misconduct allegations. Um, you could say that he refers to a term, an online term, rather than talking about his responsibility. You could use the word deflection. The governor deflects. Let's see how many letters in deflect. Close enough. It'll get us there. It's close to cancel, right? So there are other words that we could use. It just takes a little bit more, right? A little more time thinking, a little more time having conversations about what is actually happening. It takes time to come up with terms and to name things. But I want to emphasize that the work that we do as journalists is in fact creating social reality. That is the reason that people have declared us enemies of the state, the enemies of the public. It is the reason that the First Amendment is enshrined with a freedom of the press. It is a responsibility to create the world that actually exists, not the one that dominant forces say we should resist. So we talk in very specific terms. That, for me, is the way that we approach this. So there's another another question. We'll take one more question and then um, we can continue this conversation upstairs. You want to ask your question? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah. So I know the origins of terms like that on the internet can be very confusing, but um, just from personal experience, there was a time that I used the word cancel culture, like thinking it's a good thing, um, but then it very quickly turned south. So I'm wondering, um, did the was the term coined by black, the black Twitter community or um, people who were very against it or um, people who just didn't know where it originated from? That is an excellent question. Um, and it's actually one of the slides that I took out of this presentation, so now I wish I, I still had it there. Um, so the stem, the way that Black Twitter talked about cancellation first uh, was we talked about it as call-out culture. That was what we actually referred to it as. So if you were to do um, a deep search of Twitter history, you would find references to call-out culture. That's why Loretta Ross used that as part of her essay for the New York Times. We got cancel culture in my research from two things. Uh, one, this practice of calling people out online, but also a meme. Is anybody familiar with Joanne the Scammer? <laughs> okay, couple couple vibes of rec recognition there. Uh, Joanne the Scammer is, man, I wish I, I had a picture. So, um, is this connected to the internet? There's some, maybe I can get some Google images. I 
I'm scared to click on the full image because I don't know what else is on that page, but you, you get the idea right. So as I mentioned in the talk, there are things that come up from digital culture and over time in the way that they get adopted by news media in the same way that Manju said, hey, this is what all black people are doing on Twitter, they get imbued with a different meaning. So Joanne the Scammer is a character played by uh, this guy named Brandon, I forget Brandon's last name, uh, but Joanne the Scammer is supposed to be a white woman who has a very lovely home, she's high class, and she's high class because she scammed her way into the upper echelon of society. So he came up with all of these skits, and he would do things like he'd come into a workplace um, and it was very racially loaded. Oops, uh, he would come into a workplace and do something like say, all right, all of the white girls sit in the back. Get in the back. Go, go back there. But then he would do stuff like this. He'd say, that's over. That's canceled. So this is an espresso machine in a workplace. And Joanne the scammer comes in. She points to it. She says, that's over. That's canceled. And then what you began to see was that people would use that language to talk to one another. Well, that's over, that's canceled, you're canceled. I'm gonna cancel this, I'm gonna cancel that, right? That sort of online language within meme culture on Tumblr made its way over to Twitter, where Twitter is easily observable because it's a broadcast platform. Journalists started to pick up on it there but then over on YouTube, you've got people who have drama channels. Anybody keep up with YouTube? Specifically, Judy. <laughs> Hold your head high, queen. Um, <laughs> beauty bloggers started canceling each other. And so they would create these whole videos about why you should cancel this brand, or this person, or you know some group, or what have you. And so in the ecosystem that is the internet and that is journalists on the internet sort of plucking things from this ecosystem, we got the, the word cancel, where people are using cancel to quote unquote cancel one another, and then we assign the term culture to it. Because culture, again, that Merriam-Webster definition, allows us to isolate and to assign specific meaning to a certain group. It allows us to pathologize what a group of people are doing. And so if we say that this is a certain kind of culture, and we're saying that these people are intolerant, that they believe in shouting others down, that there's no room for a debate or discussion, there's no nuance there. And so as cancel culture got reported on, let me go back to my slides really quickly, as being canceled, rather. This was one of the first major stories on being canceled. Um, Jonah interviewed me for this story, and I gave a definition of what it meant to be canceled. When the New York Times says something is a thing, as the paper of record, it becomes a thing. So when people started referring to being canceled, they added culture to basically say that this is something that is endemic to a particular group of people, and we are not like them. And so that is the problem that I see with referring to something as a specific culture. That you have got a phenomenon that was born in an offline setting, right? It was born out of reading and dragging people. It had an evolution with meme culture. Then it was excerpted and presented in mainstream news media because people don't have the frame of reference to understand its roots, they simply call it a culture. So that is the evolution of the term over time. Great question. Thank you. Dr. Clark, thank you so very much.